Perhaps you've heard there's a solar eclipse tomorrow. I'm not sure when the countdown on KWTX TV began, but we are finally down to one more day. This morning on the KWTX news, the banner came up. It did not say one more day, it said tomorrow. I can hardly wait till tomorrow morning to see if it's going to say today. <clears throat> or maybe it's going to say today, finally. But uh, the solar eclipse is a big thing. In the 1980s, Debbie and I were living in Virginia, and we experienced a partial solar eclipse. I don't guess there was any talk about glasses back then. They had you make up this little thing where you could, the sun would shine through and you could kind of see it on the piece of paper. But we went out in the front yard at the eclipse time and all of a sudden or over a period of a short period of time, it darkened. The temperature dropped by several degrees. It was amazing and eerie. Well, tomorrow we have a total eclipse right here in our neighborhood. All we have to do is go outside. Hopefully the weather will cooperate. Now, most of us won't be around the next time a total eclipse is viewable in Central Texas. In fact, there are solar eclipses all the time, but usually they're out over the oceans where there's nobody out there. But this one is here. And clouds permitting, we can see it tomorrow. Light is defined as the natural agent that stimulates sight and makes things visible. Or a slightly shorter definition, something that makes vision possible. We could say that we know light, what light is when we see it. Darkness is defined as the partial or complete absence of light. If you don't have light, you have darkness. Don't know that a parent has ever said to the child, go and turn out the darkness, because you can't really do it. You can turn out the light. The word darkness occurs 153 times in the English Standard Version. The word light occurs 277 times in the English Standard Version. In many texts in Scripture, the words light or darkness fit the definitions just given. This is the case in the opening words of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. God created the sun, the moon, the stars. We have been able to discover their patterns. Tomorrow's eclipse will not be a surprise. It's been expected, predicted for a long, long time. Because God created a very orderly universe. The eclipse tomorrow is another sign of of God, that our universe has a designer. Ever since God created light, there's been light and there's been darkness. The ninth of the ten plagues on Egypt was darkness for three days. It was a darkness that could be felt. Debbie has memories of years ago 
being in Carlsbad Caverns, where at one moment they turn out the lights and it's dark. The interesting thing is when this plague came upon Egypt, there was light where the Israelites were. They weren't left in the darkness. God used physical darkness to show his power. The ten plagues basically are showing that God is God and the false gods of Egypt are nothing. That God has power, Pharaoh does not. During the crucifixion of Jesus, there was darkness over the whole land from noon until 3 p.m. Luke says the sun's light failed. God again used his power to make a point. His son was upon the cross, dying for the sins of the world. However, several times in Scripture, light and darkness have a spiritual meaning. Darkness can mean wickedness or evil. This morning, I want us to look at a few of those texts this morning. We're by no means going to look at all of them, of course. In fact, we're going to concentrate on the text about light and darkness that we find in the Gospel of John and in his first letter. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Frank Pack commented upon these mm -hmm. verses. As light is used here in a moral and spiritual sense, so darkness stands for the spiritual darkness of man away from God, groping in the darkness of fears, doubts, anxieties, ignorance, sins, and hatred of the good. The light pierces the darkness, drives it back, for darkness is hostile rebellion against the will of God. Jesus, the Word, was with God and was God. Later, John will say the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But the Word, Jesus, the Son of God, is pictured as light. A light that comes and shines in the darkness. And the darkness cannot overcome. That light cannot overcome Jesus. John was speaking of Jesus when he wrote that the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world, chapter 1, verse 9. We come on down to John chapter 3. There we have Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night, wanting to interview him, ask him some questions. And after that <clears throat> exchange, we have the familiar verses John 3.16, for God so loved the world. And after that, notice what we read in verses 19 through 21. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. A lot of evil takes place in darkness. It seems that thieves prefer darkness. It's harder to see what they're doing. We have security lights around our buildings, sometimes around our houses, to ward off those who would do evil under the cover of darkness. In a sense, when one sins, he prefers darkness. 
He prefers that his sin not be exposed. But of course, sin cannot be hidden from God. And Jesus is the light. We should prefer the light. But sadly, too many prefer darkness and all that goes with it. In John chapter 8, verse 12, we read, and Jesus spoke to them. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus says, I'm the light. John had already said that he was the light. Jesus makes this acclamation. And he says, if you follow me, whoever will follow me will not walk in darkness. If we're out at night, if it's dark, which it is at night unless you're around lights, we want to have a source of light quite often. It's easier not to stumble if we have a light in front of us. If we follow Jesus, we're in the light. And that will help to keep us from stumbling spiritually. John chapter 12, verses 34 through 36 and verse 46. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Jesus had been speaking <clears throat> about that he was going to be lifted up. In other words, he's going to be crucified. He refers to himself most often as the Son of Man. Some of his detractors knew that he was basically saying that he was the Messiah, or that many were saying he was the Messiah. But they said, what we see in the law is that the Christ, that is the Messiah, will remain forever. But you're saying that you will be lifted up, you'll be put to death. Just who is this Son of Man? And Jesus replied, the light is among you for a little while longer. He was there in his ministry. He was concluding that ministry. Yes, he was going to be lifted up, that is crucified. And he says to them, basically, walk while you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. Quite often, if we're out in the dark, we don't have a source of light. We can very easily not know where we're going. We can get lost. Jesus says, while you have the light, while you have me, believe in the light, believe in me, that you may become sons of light. There would be many who would reject Jesus as the light. They would reject him as the Messiah. They would reject him as the Savior. They would remain in spiritual darkness. We come to 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. There John writes, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Just as Jesus is the light, so his Father God, of course, is the light. And John pictures him that way. And when you have God, you don't have darkness. He does away with the darkness. 
But Paul says, if you say you have fellowship with God, but you're walking in darkness, you lie. You're not practicing the truth. What does he say? If you claim to be a follower of God, but you're doing the things of darkness, in other words, you're doing sin, doing the things of evil, you're basically a liar. Spiritually, we cannot be in the light and in the dark at the same time. We can't even do that physically. You can be in the dark, you can be in the light, you can't be both at the same time. And so John admonishes us to be careful about our walk, to make sure it is in the light. In chapter 2, verses 7 through 11 of his first letter, John writes, Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. John says, in one sense, I'm not writing a new commandment to you. Jesus had commanded, love your neighbors yourself. He had commanded, love your enemies. He had said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. John's readers had heard these words of Jesus, no doubt. But John also says, in some ways, it is a new commandment. They needed to concentrate on their love for each other. John makes the point, we know what, God, what love is because God loved us first. He says, the darkness is passing away. The true light is already shining. We must keep the light of God before us. We must not let darkness invade, overcome the light in our lives. And there is a very practical example given. If you love your brother, you abide in the light. <clears throat> if you do that, there's no reason for you to stumble. But if you hate your brother or your sister, then you are in darkness. You're walking in darkness. You basically don't know where you're going because the darkness has blinded your sight. There are some very religious people who aren't very careful about their attitude toward others, who often they hate. Basically, one cannot hate and be in the light. One cannot hate and be in fellowship with God. What we see from this text and from numerous others written to Christians is that spiritual darkness must be avoided. Darkness in Scripture often is used to represent sin. And sin separates us from God, will cause us to be lost. We have light, we have light, we have darkness. I saw a little meme, I guess I saw it yesterday, and posted it on Facebook. It says, the moon will be out tonight as it is every night. In like manner, we're just pretty confident that tomorrow morning, the sun's going to come up. And I realize that the sun's not coming up. The earth is, you know, I realize all that. I, I was awake that, for that part of science class. <clears throat> but we know that the sun will shine tomorrow. 
may be cloudy, so it may not be bright. We know the exact time tomorrow that we will have sunset when the earth turns and we're no longer in the sun. We can be confident in that because of God and his design. And yes, we know at a certain time tomorrow afternoon, we will have the eclipse. And I hope it's not cloudy. Justin Jordan Guy, Reverend Jordan Guy, preaches for the College Church of Christ in Searcy, Arkansas. And last Sunday he used the eclipse as an illustration in his introduction. You see, Searcy is also in the path of the total eclipse. And lots of folks are gathering in that area to witness it. In fact, Hardy University is having some special events. But he was making the point that there are people who travel to witnesses the total eclipses. That's their bucket list item. They go from one eclipse to the other. And I like the way he put it. Some people travel the world in pursuit of darkness. Well, that's okay if you're talking about the eclipse. Some people, it seems, devote all their energies in pursuit of spiritual darkness. And that will cause one to be lost. Let us be people of the light. Let us seek the light. Let us seek to follow Jesus. Jesus.